definition we can give. And um, from this starting point, we can expand to say that um, in political theory, we're mostly concerned with civil disobedience based on this decision about whether it's justified or not. So is civil disobedience morally justified or not? So most of today's talk is going to be about this question. Um, can we separate civil disobedience, which is morally justified law breaking, um, from just breaking the law, from criminal behavior? Um, secondly, uh, do people have the obligation to agree with or accept laws if they're made democratically? So is there a relationship between democracy and civil disobedience um, where civil disobedience is either more or less valid based on the political system in which it takes place? Um, we'll look at John Rawls' discussion of civil disobedience and we'll look at some theorists of civil disobedience as well. Right, so let's look and try to improve our definition about what civil disobedience is. Um, the way we define it seems to have a very important impact on whether we think it's justified or not. Now, of course, if you're in power and you don't like people protesting against what you're doing, um, you're going to say everybody who breaks the law to protest against you is just a criminal. Right? They're just breaking the law. So if you focus on the law-breaking aspect of civil disobedience, there is a deliberate attempt to associate civil disobedience with criminal behavior, with criminality and delegitimize the moral content of it. All right, so the criminalization of civil disobedience ignores the moral argument. And as we'll see, um, the moral component is the most important part of why people break the law for political reasons. All right, and this is what separates civil disobedience from all the other forms of just breaking the law. So a fundamental part of civil disobedience and what it is, is breaking the law. But it's the reason that people break the law that separates between civil disobedience and general criminal behavior. Right? One possible view of civil disobedience is morally justified law breaking. In other words, you're breaking a law for a moral reason. Right? And so for an act to count as civil disobedience, it has to not just be illegal, it has to not just be morally justified, but the third component it needs is that it needs to be intended to change government's law or policy. Right, so to change a specific law or policy. So a possible working definition we have after all of that is that civil disobedience is morally justified law breaking intended to change government law or policy. Right, so the first theorist we'll look at is Henry David Thoreau um, from the United States and you know, did lots of stuff. He was a writer, a poet, philosopher, political figure. Um, he was a noted opponent of Slavery, he was a noted critic of development, right? So he was a naturalist and for various political reasons uh, disagreed with development, right? One way we can measure his impact was the number of people who he influenced and also <clears throat> the importance of the people he influenced. So among the people who followed his writings a lot were Martin Luther King Jr. and Mohandas Gandhi, the Indian independence leader. Now, the fact that he influenced people who then had a huge influence on the world is a measure of the importance of his ideas, I suppose. Um, the main book that he wrote is in Resistance to Civil Government. He provides a justification for why and when citizens should engage in civil disobedience. When is it correct to resist the government in a non-violent way? Right? When is it correct to go against what the government wants? Now, Thoreau, among other things, um, one reason we should respect him, even if we disagree with him, is that he lived the principles he believed, right? Um, and the example of this is that the United States, as you know, or probably you don't, but you know, um, the US is as big as it is, right? Because it conquered large parts of what used to be Mexico. That's the reason many US cities have Spanish names, like Los Angeles and San Francisco and, te and like Texas as the state, for example, these are all Spanish names, right? Because they used to be part of Mexico, right? So this all happened during the U.S.-Mexican War, and Thoreau argued that this war was an immoral war. It's just a land grab where the Americans decided they wanted to be bigger, so they conquered other places, right? So how did he protest against it? He said, "Well, if I pay my taxes to the U.S. government, they're going to use that money to hire soldiers to buy weapons to fund the war. So I'll deliberately not pay tax, knowing that I'm going to get in trouble." 
because I, that's the morally correct thing to do. I'd rather not pay tax and therefore not be part of this war than to just go along with what everybody else does. So I'll pay a personal price to not be involved in this moral, immoral behavior. Right, so Thoreau's argument in the book really says that individuals have a moral duty to break unjust laws. So if the law is not fair, if the law is not just, you as an individual have the moral duty to break that law. Right? You can't just keep following it out of your own personal self-interest. And this is one limitation of Thoreau's argument, is it basically says that the whole argument centers around personal integrity, you know, about what the individual's moral character is. You know, that, that your moral integrity and your need to be a moral person is going to lead you to break laws that are unjust. Right? So, um, his argument is not centered around things like, well, how do we communicate our message to the largest number of people, or how do we convince people as quickly as possible, or how do we influence people the most, right? It's just individuals have moral duties. They need to follow those moral duties by breaking the law if necessary. So the second problem with Thoreau's argument is that it doesn't really say under what circumstances civil disobedience is justified or not. And we'll see the other theorists we study today spend a lot of time talking about this. You know, when is it right to protest an unjust law? When is it not right? right? So taken to a logical conclusion, uh, what this suggests is that individuals have a moral duty to protest against everything that they disagree with, to protest against every law that they find unjust or unfair. Um, and this line of argument seems to suggest that there's never a possibility of non-protest. In other words, as soon as something is bad, we must protest it. We can't just go along with anything. You know, we can't compromise with anything, right? So he's a totally uncompromising person, which is probably what made him so influential um, and powerful as a thinker, right? But um, perhaps some of his ideas are not very practical to live by. You know, if you meet a person who never compromises on anything, uh, you know, they can be very difficult to work with, I suppose. Um, so next is Gandhi, uh, the Indian nationalist independence figure. I mean, he started his career as a lawyer, pretty boring, but sort of graduated to political activism. You know, we're way better than FLL. Um, so Gandhi's most known for his leading role in the Indian independence movement and his theory of Satyagraha, which is basically um, a non-violent method of political protest. Again, based on this idea that um, we can convince people in power to listen to us um, through this protest and through civil disobedience, right? But the, the, the sort of foundational part of convincing other people to listen to us is that we have to have personal integrity. So if we're some sort of loser who does the wrong thing all the time and has no moral center, and we say, by the way, your laws are unjust, um, people are going to laugh at us um, because we have no moral center, right? So the starting point of his theory is basically we have individual moral duties. You know, I've listed some of the ones he believed here. So non-violence, truth, non-stealing, chastity, rejecting possessions, doing labor, and vegetarianism. And we can debate and discuss whether these are valid principles or not. But basically, whatever concept of morality you have, you have to be a moral person. Once you're a moral person, you can protest and people are more likely to listen to you. Right? If you're not a moral person, you protest, people are more likely to ignore you or laugh or you know, arrest you or something like that, not listen to your point of view. And then we have Martin Luther King. Um, you know, he was started as a religious leader, but became a, more famous for, as a political activist, I suppose, and, and a leader of the American Civil Rights Movement. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 1964, um, opposing racial discrimination in the United States. Um, you probably know his I Have the Dream speech. If you don't, you should be kicked out of a program immediately, a failure to participate in political science. Um, what you probably don't know is that he was spied on by the US government, and specifically by COINTELPRO, which is the FBI's counterterrorism wing. Right? So this happened when he said he was opposed to the Vietnam War. So he decided he was against the Vietnam War, and COINTELPRO decided then that he was against the United States' interests. Um, and then soon after that, he suddenly died, got assassinated by James Earl Ray, um, sort of white supremacist, at least that's the allegation. But you know, there's lots of speculation about who actually killed him. 
right? So a series of dodgy coincidences about politics leads to him suddenly dying as soon as he decides that he's opposed to the Vietnam War. Yeah, you can work that out for yourself. Right, so um, here's the discussion between criminality and civil disobedience. Um, criminals and the civilly disobedient both break the law. And the question is, can we separate these types of behavior, criminal behavior and civilly disobedient behavior? Are they different or are they really just the same? Right, so to understand this, we basically need to look at how and why the law is being broken. Now, if we want to break the law, um, there's four different reasons we should break the law, according to this like, way of understanding. Like, we can break the law based on individual self-interest, right? If you're honest with me, you've all probably broken the law based on individual self-interest at some point. Not serious laws, but you know, I'm sure you've crossed the street when the man is red or you've like driven your car or a bike or something through a red light or you know, you took a library book back one day beyond when it was due or something like, you know, you've, you've, you've violated a law based on self-interest, right? Nobody's completely law-abiding at all times. Okay, um, then we have group interest. So that's when the law isn't in the interest of a group. So for example, um, you know, okay, I'll use the same example as the last class. So um, China's existence, the People's Republic of China came about based on group interest law breaking. Right? There was another government in place. Some people didn't like it, so they overthrew that government, you know, chucked them out of power. That was obviously illegal, right? And it became the state. Right? So group interest law breaking. Um, morality law breaking, where a law is perceived to be morally wrong, so we break it because we think it's morally wrong. It goes against some sort of overall spiritual value that we hold. Right? Or an unjust law, where we would perceive it to be unfair or something like that. Right? So, People who defend civil disobedience reject individual self-interest as a reason for breaking the law. Okay, if you break the law for an individual reason, that seems to just be criminal behavior, right? And the extent to which we're criminals is debatable. Um, you know, maybe you only break small traffic laws or return library books late. Maybe you rob banks. Maybe it's something in between, right? This type of thing is done for your individual self-interest. It's not for a political reason. Right, and so this is what we call criminal behavior. Now, in terms of group interest, we've looked at different theories this semester that cover why large groups of individuals should break laws based on group interest. Marxism and nationalism are two good examples. Right, Marxists argue that the working class as a whole has different interests than the capitalist system, right, and has an interest in socialism the capitalists are unlikely to allow socialism to happen just by itself. You know, they'll contest it and they'll try and fight to make sure that capitalism stays. And they'll use the state power that they have, you know, the control that they have over the government to protect capitalism. All right, so Marxists will then argue that it's in a group's interest, the working class interest, to overthrow the capitalist system, to break the law and replace the capitalist system with a socialist system. Right? Um, and then nationalism, for example, like China's another really good example of nationalist group interest law breaking, right? So, um, you know, Japan at one point colonized a large part of China, you know, set up its own legal system and that. Um, people quite correctly said that that was rubbish and they should be thrown out, you know, but obviously um, opposing the Japanese imperial government was illegal at the time at that place. So nationalist group interest law breaking involved so saying, well, we can only be free as a nation by breaking the existing laws and throwing out this occupying power, you know, throwing them out of power, right? So those are good examples of group interest law breaking that are not civil disobedience. Why are they not civil disobedience? Because they involve revolutionary acts. Like it's like overthrowing the government. And we'll see why civil disobedience isn't overthrowing the government in a second. So one important reason is that these are not making moral arguments about specific laws, these are advocating social transformation, including social transformation possibly by force, right? So um, whether it's overthrowing the capitalist class or overthrowing and occupying imperialist power, both examples show that sometimes people break the law out of group interest and that's not civil disobedience, right? So one major thing separates civil disobedience from 
revolutions, whether they're nationalist or socialist revolutions. Um, that is that civil disobedience argues using the moral ideas of the oppressing party. You know, one big example is like when the Indian independence movement was trying to get rid of the British, um, a key argument that they used was, that, well, okay, you're the British, you, you basically invented liberalism, or at least you seem to talk about it a lot. Liberalism involves having free individuals being free, and yet you colonized half of the world. Right, you've conquered half of the world and made it your possession. And people don't have self-determination or freedom in your colonies. Right, so how do you reconcile those two ideas? Right? You're defending and protecting freedom, supposedly, but then telling us that we can't be free. You know, um, they're using the moral ideas of the oppressing party. Right? And saying, well, you need to live up to your own ideas. Right, so most theories of civil disobedience are based on this, based on the idea that there is a law somewhere that is not moral for some reason, right? Or unjust for some reason. And that, that is the specific law that we're going to try and break in order to get it changed. So um, then the question is that uh, do you have to be an altruist to be civilly disobedient? An altruist is a person who only cares about other people and not about themselves. You have to be a completely selfless person, right? Or can you be self-interested and be civilly disobedient as well? Right, so altruism puts the interests of others above our self-interest. Does all of the foregoing discussion say that we have to be altruists in order to follow this method of civil disobedience? Right now, a person might be um, pursuing their own self-interest, but the argument here is that so long as they're pursuing a morally justified cause or addressing some sort of injustice, a person can still be rationally self-interested and be civilly disobedient at the same time. Right? So there's no necessary contradiction there. So I guess it's important to talk quickly about what civil disobedience is not. You know, we've just talked about what it is. So what type of behaviors are not included in civil disobedience? Um, a few things we can rule out immediately, and this hopefully clarifies the concept a bit. So civil disobedience is not legal forms of protest. You know, in most countries, there are legal ways to protest things. So, you know, if you just march on the street about something, you know, um, you can usually get the government's permission to do that in a limited way, as long as you give them advance notice, as long as you promise not to break anything, as long as you promise to be peaceful, right? So legal forms of protest are not the same as civil disobedience. To be civilly disobedient, you must break the law in order to address an immoral law or an injustice of some kind. Right, so it has to be an illegal act. If it's legal, it's not civil disobedience. And on the other hand, revolution is not civil disobedience. Right, so if your goal is to overthrow the existing society and replace it with a totally new social system, that's not civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is when you're appealing to the people in power and saying that, well, you need to change your behavior based on your own principles, based on principles that you hold. You need to be consistent with those principles and follow what you're saying, right? So um, we're not talking about things that are legal and we're not talking about things that involve a total social transformation, right? Civil disobedience is this kind of middle position, I guess, that involves sort of working within the system but breaking the laws of the system at the same time. Right, so one common argument then is, is civil disobedience valid in a democratic society? Because in democracy, um, most people have agreed either with a law or with most of the people who make the law. Right? They've selected them through an election. Um, so are democracies different? Is it more or less valid to do civil disobedience in a democracy than not? Right, so specifically, if everybody has had a role in deciding the type of government that we have, or the type of policies that exist, is it valid to protest against those policies using the method of civil disobedience? Right, so Peter Singer um, is a political theorist who discusses many things, and it's definitely worth reading, um, but in particular talks about this question. So he tries to argue that democracies shouldn't tolerate civil disobedience, that it should be highly discouraged, and they should do things to stop it. Um, and uses the members of a club or a university society example um, in his book. So it basically says, uh, let's imagine we're a club or a society at this university. Now, there's two possible ways that this club can make decisions. 
either you give me all the power, right? You make me the dictator, or make one of yourselves the dictator. I don't care who the dictator is. Um, and you make all the decisions, right? The leader makes all the decisions. Or we have a democratic method where we discuss stuff and we make the decision together, and whoever is the majority wins and gets the decision they want. Right? So the overall question he's going to ask is, is civil disobedience a valid method under the leader model? Is it a valid method under the democracy model? So um, let's imagine that we make a proposal to buy a newspaper for our club or society. And the newspaper contains stuff that's offensive or insulting to at least one of us, but more likely more of us. You know, um, you know, the demographics of this class is kind of unfortunate. In the first class, we had more men than women. So I said, well, what if the men all decided to buy stuff, like buy a newspaper that was offensive to women, you know, it contained all kinds of dodgy images or sexist jokes and things like that, right? Okay, let's reverse it and say that the men are the victims somehow. And all of the girls in the class say, okay, we're gonna buy this like anti-male magazine and just like make jokes about men all the time and just like make fun of them. And we'll buy a newspaper that supports that point of view, right? So, if you're opposed to the like, okay, how does the decision happen? In the leader model, it's because the dictator has made the decision to buy the newspaper, right? Very simple, they like the newspaper, they buy it. In the democracy model, it's a bit different because at least most people have decided to buy this newspaper, right? So. It has the legitimacy in the sense that most people have agreed to it at some level. Okay. Now, if we don't like the newspaper, in the leader model, what do we do? We try and convince the leader, hey, that newspaper sucks. You know, stop buying it. It's offensive. We don't like it. We really want you to change your mind, right? And either one of two things has happened. He's going to listen to us or not. Okay. Probably not. In the democracy model, we have an even more complicated task, which we have to convince a whole lot of people to change their mind, right? Um, to change their mind from what they previously agreed on. So they might have previously agreed to buy this newspaper, and we have to convince lots of people that disagree to buy the newspaper in the future. Right? So we have an even more difficult task. So then the question is, are we justified in practicing civil disobedience, such as, what if we wake up really early every morning, and as the newspaper gets delivered, we steal it and burn it, and then nobody gets to read it, because we think it's a horrible newspaper. So we make sure that nobody gets to read it, and we do so by breaking the law. Okay, is this justified in the leader model? Is this justified in the democracy model? Right? Is there a difference between the two? Right? Does this act of protest become more valid if only one person made the decision to buy the newspaper, or does it become less valid if, if most people decided to buy this newspaper? That's the question. So Singer's argument says that in the democracy model we're not justified in trashing the newspaper, right? And the reason for this is that we've participated in democracy as well, right? So if we voluntarily participated in this vote, Singer's argument is that, well, you agreed to be part of this club voluntarily, you agreed to be part of this political process voluntarily, you voted voluntarily, and then you didn't get what you wanted, right? But that doesn't mean you can just break the law whenever you don't get what you want. Why? Because democracy is part of fair compromise. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about fair compromise between people who share different moral views. Right? And that, that's sort of um, one of the things that democracy does is decide that when lots of people disagree with each other, who gets what they want? Not everybody's going to get what they want. Right? So this principle of fair compromise is a complex one, and Singer then differentiates between absolute fairness and fair compromise. So for example, fair compromise is something that's only fair under specific conditions. Um, let's say two people are claiming to own a bunch of money. You know, okay, let's, let's make it more humorous. Um, I'm going to steal all of your wallets right now. You know, and I take all of the money out, and you know, I've got all of your money. And then right as I'm about to run out of the class, you tackle me and stop me, and then all the money falls down onto the ground. Right now, none of you know whose money is whose anymore. All we know is that there's a bunch of money on the ground. There's you, and there's me. And so you call my boss, and he's like, oh, he stole our money. And, he, and my boss says, how can you prove that it's your money? 
And then you realize you're screwed because you have no way of proving that it's your money. It's just your word against mine. Okay? And um, so, what's the fairest thing to do in this situation? Well, Singer says that, well, fair compromise in this situation would mean giving the money equally between us. You know, we'd have to share the money because we have no way of proving who originally owned it. Now, is this fair in the absolute sense? No, it's not because it's your money, I stole it. You know? But because you can't prove it, the fairest possible option is to share the money. I hope that kind of makes sense. So fair compromise is not absolutely fair because we know deep down only really you owe the money. I did. Right, but the fairest possible option, given the conditions, is this compromise of sharing the money. Right, so fair compromise is unfair in the absolute sense, but fair given the situation. You know, and that's a diff difficult thing to reason through ethically. You know, because like from a very young age, I guess we're taught that there's like this absolute right and wrong. You know, that things are either always good or always bad. There's good and evil and that sort of stuff. Right. This is a much more complex territory because you know, Singer is saying that there are these situations where something can be unfair and yet fair at the same time. You know, that, that's kind of difficult. So, as a result, Singer says we can't remove the newspaper even if it offends us because democracy involves this fair compromise. You know, on the one hand, we have the right to express our opinion. On the other hand, people don't have to agree with us, right? They, they, they even if we don't agree with them, we still have the right to say what we feel. Right? And this is the compromise between uh, people's freedom of expression and people who not always get what they want in a democratic system. Right, so rejecting fair compromise, Singer says as well, that's depriving other people of their rights, you know, their right to freedom of expression. Um, so that is what justifies suppressing civil disobedience according to this position. Now, um, and in a response to this, we can consider problems with democracy and therefore problems with fair compromise. So let's look at some situations where Singer's argument might not be valid. Now, most democracies that actually exist are what we call representative democracies. That was the exam question you screwed up on the right? Um, direct democracy is where we make decisions in person. Representative democracy is where we elect somebody else to make decisions. Us, right now, most democracies are representative. Um, now, the problem with this is that in a representative democracy, the elected representatives don't always follow public opinion. Right? They don't always make popular decisions. I mean, they often do, but they don't always do what the public wants. Okay, so does this then justify a specific group communicating why they're unhappy with the government's decision? through civil disobedience. You know, if the government consistently does something the public doesn't want, and it's a representative leadership, you know, um, does that then justify civil disobedience as a form of protest? Right. Secondly, um, voting doesn't give us an indication of how strongly we feel or how strongly an issue affects us. You know, so um, how do we balance against, so let's say most of us only slightly support something. Um, but there's a small group of us that really strongly oppose that thing, right? It makes us marginally happy, but it makes them terribly unhappy. How do we balance against those things? Now, the, the answer is that democracy doesn't balance against those things. In a democratic system, everybody votes once, that's it. The votes are all equal, you know, but the majority wins, the minority loses, right? So there's no attempt to balance how important things are to people, um, how significant issues are to people how much people care about certain issues, right? Um, so civil disobedience can account for how strongly we feel about things, because clearly, like, if you see a group of people protesting something and being prepared to be arrested, you can tell they really care about that issue, right? When Thoreau got arrested by the US government protesting against the US-Mexican war, you know, some people agreed with his protest and some people disagreed, but everybody was convinced that he really cared about the issue. Because anybody who's prepared to go to jail for a political protest obviously cares about what they're going to jail for. Right? So it gives you instant credibility in that way. Um, then there's a the question of what if you're a permanent minority, right? So if your opinion or your position is always going to be the minority opinion and you can't somehow convince the majority yet, 
um, with the existing amount of power that you've got. Right? Maybe civil disobedience is the only way to make them listen to you. you know? like if, if people really aren't listening and there's no reason for them to listen to you, sometimes nonviolent protest, nonviolent law breaking is the only thing that's going to change their mind. Right? Because if we take away civil disobedience, the only other option a permanent minority has to get us to listen to them is political violence. You know, that's the subject of next week's lecture. Right? If you take away people's ability to non-violently protest, then their only choice is to basically just be violent. You know, to, to challenge the authority of the state. You know, to, to take the state on in a violent way. Right? Civil disobedience is the last form of non-violent protest before actually violence starts. Right? So if Singer, his ideas get taken to their logical conclusion, right? it's the job of the government to restrict civil disobedience and make it, prevent it from happening. The question then is, um, if people feel like they're never going to be listened to, does that push them towards violent behavior? Then there's a the question about people who can't vote or have no political rights. And if you're a non-citizen living in another country, or there's lots of other people who can't vote in many countries. If you've ever committed criminal offense, you can't vote. Um, in many, most countries throughout history, like women couldn't vote for the first time of democracy, right? So that, that was sort of a thing. Um, children certainly can't vote. Um, in some places, people with mental illnesses can't vote. Um, in some places, like there's, there's lots of reasons you can't vote. So if you're one of these people who can't vote, um, and if you disagree with the government's policy, it really gives you two options. Right? You can perform civil disobedience, you know, non-violent law breaking, or you can engage in political violence, right? Now, of the two options, which one would you prefer, I guess? Is it, um, but if you, if you restrict civil disobedience, really that's saying that you know, you're pushing these people towards political violence as well, right? Then what about people who can't act for themselves in a political way, or not people, but what about things that can't act for themselves in a political way? So animal rights activists, environmentalists, and ecologists all use civil disobedience. And why do they like this method? Because the things that they're protesting for can't do politics. I don't know, maybe your dog can do politics, but I haven't met any animals that can organize protests or lobby the government or vote. You know, so until such time, I certainly haven't met any trees that can vote. You know, if, like I said in the last class, if, tree, if the world was a democracy and trees could vote, we'd have no, no environmental problems, right? They would have always won the vote, right? So the simple fact that some things can vote, like human beings have political rights, but animals and the natural world doesn't have political rights, right? So environmentalists will say, well, it's our duty to act on behalf of these things that can't vote and have no political rights because they can't defend themselves. So what if people aren't listening to us? Well, therefore we need civil disobedience to convince people to listen, right? There's lots of things that are impacted by democracy that have no rights in the democracy, animals, the environment, stuff like that. And then there's the question of future generations. So what about people who don't yet exist? You know, like uh, the generation that comes after us is probably going to have to deal with horrific consequences of global warming and stuff like that um, if we don't drastically change the way that we currently live. So um, are we justified in following civil disobedience um, to impact the way people think today so that tomorrow is different from what it is today, I guess, right? Um, are we justified in doing that because we're representing people who don't exist yet? That's the question. So every society has differences between individual and group interests. That's why the state exists, right? Um, but most societies also have differences in how we understand morality. I hope by the end of the semester, you know, you've talked and interacted with each other a little bit, even though you sit in the same damn seats every week. And, you know, don't meet new people, but you know, that's a criticism I'll leave aside. Um, from your discussions and from the talks in class, you should at least know, if you forget everything else, you should at least be aware that even though you're roughly the same age, and even though you're from roughly the same place, and you exist in the same time and space as each other, that you mostly disagree about everything, right? And that you have, there's more things that you disagree about than agree about. 
when it comes to morality, when it comes to what's good for society, when it comes to that sort of thing. And there's lots of reasons you have these disagreements, you know, partly your own personal interest and just partly the way you see the world is different, right? Um, but for a political system to be stable and legitimate, there needs to be some kind of shared morality, even if we don't agree on every political issue, right? Um, if everybody disagrees about everything, there can be no political system. Any political system depends on us agreeing about something. Right, so Singer suggests that shared morality is a reason to reject civil disobedience. We're about to look at John Rawls' argument that civil disobedience can still be justified even in a system based on a shared morality. Right, so Rawls in the last section of a theory of justice, like a short section, talks about reasons why civil disobedience might be okay and the circumstances under which it's okay. Yeah, and basically his argument goes that, oh, well, what if a society is mostly just, but has some unjust aspects about it, right? How do we return a slightly unjust society to being a fully just society again? Um, so Rawls starts in a weird way, arguing that yes, you have an obligation to follow the law, which is a weird way to start sort of proving the conditions under which you have an obligation not to follow the law, but anyway. Um, Rawls starts by saying you have a duty to follow the law, but you might also have a duty to not follow an unjust law. So if the law is not just, what are the circumstances under which we can break that law? Right. So um, Rawls basically says that there's four stages that we have to go through to take principles of justice in a very abstract way and turn them into concrete laws of politics. Um, so we start with principles of justice, which in his case was the original position, but you know, imagine whatever your principles of justice are. Maybe it's you know, humanism, you believe that every human being is equal, or liberalism, or maybe you believe that socialism is correct, or maybe you believe that um, everything is equally valid, maybe you think that God is everywhere, you're a pantheist, right? You believe that every living and non-living thing contains the essence of God, I don't know. So start with whatever your principles of justice are, right? From these abstract principles, we generate a constitution. You know, in Macau, we have the basic law, that's our constitution. Um, almost every country has a constitution, right? And constitutions are developed based on some sort of principles of justice. They usually state, you know, what freedom is and what freedoms the citizens have and how the government can make laws and stuff like that. Right, in the third stage, Using the power that the government got from the Constitution, it makes specific laws within this constitutional framework. You know, Constitution's basic job is to decide what powers government has and doesn't have. You know, what are the limits to government? So within this constitutional framework, in the third stage, the government makes certain 